there have been resources available to us that we didn't know were about uh, her week in Washington, D.C., when, mm. when she experienced so much of the front lines of the war, was inspired to write the poem. So I'm, I'm very excited about uh, what, to be able to share what we now know about the immediate context there. Uh, I can even talk about the sermon she heard yeah, uh, hear less than two days before mm -hmm. she wrote the poem. So that, that, that has not happened before. So she, um, her husband was very active on the philanthropic side, a, a medical doctor, graduate of, of Harvard Medical School, he ran an institute for the deaf and blind in Boston. And when the war broke out, he and other uh, philanthropists, ministers, politicians uh, formed uh, the, uh, what was called the United States Sanitary Commission. Uh, a funny word today. Uh, it sounds like their job was to keep things clean. But, uh, it had to do with providing aid to soldiers, very practical aid to the soldiers in their encampments, uh, to help families, to provide soldiers with some of the necessities uh, and even some of the uh, like a, a deck of playing cards or something like that. So he was active and, and he and the governor of Massachusetts uh, were close friends and they would go back and forth to D.C. quite often in the early months of the war. But Julia Ward Howe and some of the other wives, uh, they wanted to go along too. And on one of these trips in November of 1861, the wives came along, the governor's wife, her pastor's wife, uh, and she came along and a few others. And she got to see wartime Washington, D.C. mobilized. Let's, let's remind ourselves exactly where we are in the story here. Uh, Lincoln, of course, elected in November of 1860, took office in March of 1861, firing on Fort Sumter, April 1861, uh, some early setbacks for Union forces in the summer of 1861, uh, first Bull Run and so on. And the war was not going well at all for the Union uh, into the fall of 1861. And she, Julie Ward Howe, was looking for some way that she could help in the war effort. Uh, she was an established poet. She had been publishing poetry since at least the 1850s. She was highly respected by Nathaniel Hawthorne, among others. And she was just looking for a way to help. She had been active in benevolent organizations. She had been uh, very active in the abolitionist movement. And at the same time, she was also just a tourist. Uh, she yeah. wanted to take in the sights of, mm -hmm. of a very, at a very exciting moment in, in the history of, of the Capitol. She uh, stayed right in downtown uh, DC and made a couple of trips over into Northern Virginia. Uh, she and her friends would take a carriage, travel out, visit the troops, because a, a lot of the uh, Massachusetts regiments were sta stationed right there across the Potomac. So they were actually able to go and visit uh, men and officers whom they knew personally. And they would have a meal with them. They would uh, visit her pastor on Sunday afternoon, went out to preach to the, to the troops. So this is the kind of thing she's busy with. And uh, on one of these occasions, actually more than one occasion, but uh, on an important occasion, she came out to witness a grand military display. She saw, as I said, more than one during her time in D.C. But as she was... Uh, surveying the troops, reviewing the troops. Uh, there was a skirmish with Confederates at, at one extreme end of, of the Union line. And uh, the, the visiting party had to quickly pack up and all the other tourists who had come out for that day had to pack up and head back into DC. And just like today, there was a major traffic jam <laughs> trying to get back into D.C. from yeah. suburban Virginia. 95, uh, it's all backed up. <laughs> all backed up. <laughs> so as she's, her carriage is just crawling uh, at the pace that the soldiers are, are marching along the side of the road. And they were singing some of their favorite songs. They asked her to sing. She was noted as a gifted musician, pianist, and vocalist. And 
they were singing their favorite marching song, John Brown's Body. Yeah. Which of course, is the tune that is now associated with the battle hymn. And the story she tells, which I have some doubts about, but the story that she tells 30 some years later is that her pastor said, uh, why don't you write better words to that splendid tune? And she claimed later that that was the spark for her. And she went to sleep that night. She woke up early the next morning in the hotel. It wasn't even light yet. She scrambled around for paper and a pencil. And she wrote out what were originally six verses of the battle hymn. Yeah. And only five of those were published in her at that time. And you can see uh, in the stanzas exactly the kinds of things she had been witnessing ever since her train made the last leg of its trip from Baltimore to D.C. all the way through the visits to these encampments. It's reflected in this poetry. One thing that becomes obvious in this poem when you do a close reading of it is that she knew her Bible cover to cover. She didn't necessarily handle her Bible correctly, but right. she knew her Bible. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And one of the things I try to emphasize in the book that this is not original with me at all, but uh, mid 19th century America is a biblically literate culture. Yeah. This, Many people learn to read. This is they 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 have the cadence, the vocabulary of the King James version yeah. in their minds. Yeah, to assume with just hearing biblical language in a politician doesn't necessarily mean oh, <laughs> they're right. orthodox. Would take George okay. Washington, Lincoln, for that example. Is, Who knows what they actually believe? That is such an important point, uh, yes. and it's more important, often more important, to notice what they never say, yeah, uh, rather than what they say. Mm. So. She, her use of archaic language, uh, mine eyes have seen, you know, this is, this is poetic language. It has this elevated poetic style, but it sounds like the King James Version. Uh, that phrase appears very rarely in scripture, but we might want to think of the prayer of Simeon, uh, you know, mine eyes have seen thy salvation. Uh, who knows? That's me speculating, but mm -hmm. it has that flavor to it. It mm -hmm. sounds like the Bible. Mm -hmm. But then much more explicitly, she's picking up uh, really violent judgment imagery from the book of Isaiah. And that as that language is echoed in Revelation, I believe Revelation 14, is that it, perhaps where it appears with the uh, grapes of wrath and trampling oh, out sure. the vintage of God's wrath? Mm -hmm. uh, so when her audience, her readers saw that language, they knew immediately that she was appropriating both the Old and the New Testament and saying, uh, this is what her eyes witnessed there on the battlefields, there in the encampments. These soldiers were the army of the Lord. Mm -hmm. They're building him an altar in the evening dews and damps. And it, it draws loosely at some points, but specifically at others, drawing from images perhaps of Gideon and his army, perhaps Joshua and his army. And we even have in the Old Testament, uh, as folks know, you know the, the building of altars uh, associated with these, with these armies. So she is, she is channeling a great deal of scripture. Uh, mm. And I think even in the discarded sixth verse, she might be working with Psalm 110, uh, so th there's a lot going on here. But then as soon as I say all that, I've got to flip to the <laughs> other side and say, yeah. w one of the keys to this poem being so durable is how general it is. Right. It never mentions the Civil War. It never says America. It never says uh, North, South. It never directly mentions the institution of slavery. Other than those famous last lines about as he died to make men holy, let us die to make men free, you don't get a statement about emancipation. And I think this is also, it's quite similar to Lincoln's Gettysburg Address from 1863, uh, just two years after she wrote this poem. Lincoln achieves very similar results. And we have to check ourselves. If I say to this to people, they say, oh, this can't be true. But then they go back and read the text of the Gettysburg Address and they see that it doesn't say North, South, never mentions Gettysburg. 
uh, it, 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 it speaks in this very evocative language that is then so easily appropriated uh -huh. symbolically mm. by later generations. And that's part of the reason why the battle hymn just goes on and on and on. Now, there's tremendous literary skill in that because just the power in, in people's assumptions. I mean, you're almost writing in a way, whether intentionally or unintentionally, that people can latch onto it and import what they want into this work into this right. hymn and then uh, to and it's done in such a kind of natural way where the appropriator whoever that is either in 1861 or in uh, 2019 just assumes that how and the hymn are is on their side whatever side that is it, exactly it just you just right. own it and you feel like yeah this person understands me but exactly. may or may not 